Genesis chapter 19 and in Luke chapter 17. Genesis 19 verses 20 and through 24 and then Luke 17, 32 through 33. I'll give you a little time to get there if you don't have those places already. But it, uh, when you have Genesis 19, you can go ahead and stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to be all over Genesis 19 this morning and some of 18 in the previous chapter, but I want us to start off by reading Genesis 19, 24 through 26. Here's our text for this morning. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife, his being Lot, his wife looked back from behind him, and she became the pillar of salt. And then if we move forward into Luke chapter 17, we'll see verses 32 and 33. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. He says, Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, this is your word and we are your people. And we come before you this morning humbled by the truth of your word, humbled by its weightiness and its heaviness. And we ask, Father, that you would let the truth of this word settle on our hearts this morning, that we would hear what you would have to say to us through this text. And we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In 1987, a private uh, radiotherapy institute in Brazil moved to a new site and unknowingly left behind a container of radioactive material inside an obsolete unit for, that was used for cancer treatments. And two burglars entered this partially demolished building and they disassembled the unit. The container with the radioactive material was deemed to have scrap value, so they wheeled it home. And there, one of the thieves punctured a small hole in the container's thick window, allowing him to see a deep blue light coming from the tiny opening that he had created. And the thieves sold the container to a man named Devar Ferreira, the owner of a local scrapyard. He noticed the blue from the punctured capsule. Thinking the capsule's contents were valuable or even supernatural, he immediately brought it into his house. And over the next three days, he invited his friends and family to view this strange glowing substance not knowing that it was radioactive. And as Mr. Ferrara and several other scrapyard workers took the machine apart, they found a shiny bluish dust, which they later told doctors glowed in the dark. Attracted by it, several people handled it, examined it, and even rubbed it on their skin. Soon many people became sick, and a medical physicist used a device to uh, confirm the presence of radioactive materials and alerted the authorities. And as a result of people coming into contact with these materials, four people died, and 112,000 people were left with radioactive contamination. Several houses had to be destroyed, and the Internal Atomic Energy Agency labeled it as one of the worst radiological incidents. And so, what, and so what's, the, what's the lesson here? It's just a little bit of pretty blue powder, powder that glows in the dark. What could it hurt? Of course, we, we might not think that way about nuclear materials, but what about sin in our lives? You know, it's just a little bit of gossip. After all, I need to tell sister so-and-so so she can pray about it. It's not really gossip if it's a prayer request, right? And so it's just a little peek at something inappropriate. After all, it's just a peek. What, what is a little look going to hurt? What is a little look going to hurt? This morning, as we think about what we just read in Genesis 19, we're going to see that a look can hurt. A look back can hurt, a look back can kill. Have you ever heard anyone say that, man, if looks could kill? If looks could kill. Well, there was one look that did kill. Lot's wife looked back at Sodom, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. We just read in Luke 17 where Jesus told us to remember Lot's wife. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look back at three central truths about Lot's wife that apply to us as well. By the way... By way of introduction, 
uh, to where we are now, we'll notice that halfway through Genesis chapter 18, God speaks to Abraham and tells him that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because he says their sin is very grievous. Now, their society was consumed with homosexuality. It was consumed with lust. It was consumed with idleness, selfishness, and a refusal to help those who were in need. Matter of fact, if you study the Bible, you will find that there are two passages in the Bible that give us a bigger picture of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah at the time. And they're, they're found in Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50, and then in the New Testament in Jude verse 7. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 through 50, God is speaking, comparing his people to to the Sodomites who were there. And he says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So notice that it's not just homosexuality. Homosexuality is included in that. But it's not just homosexuality that that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was also their haughtiness. It was their pride. It was their abundance of idleness. And then in Jude verse 7, Jude says this. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Brother, did you say this was mine? Thank you. I appreciate that. I get dried out whenever I try to talk. Matter of fact, in Jude verse 7, the Lexham English Bible translates... A portion of that, uh, they translate going after strange flesh as pursuing unnatural desire. All of that combined is why God said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Abraham intercedes. Now here's a lesson for us here. Whenever we sense the wrath of God coming, whenever we see in the Bible where God says that he's going to punish the wicked, we we know punishment is coming. We know wrath is coming. And so what do we do? We we be like Abraham. And intercede for people that we believe are going to undergo the wrath of God unless they repent. And so Abraham intercedes and he asks God. He says, God, if you can find 50 righteous men there, will you destroy it? And the Lord said, no, if I can find 50, I won't destroy it. Then Abraham said, well, what about 45 righteous people? God said, if I can find 45 righteous people... I won't destroy it. And Abraham kept interceding, and the number of righteous people that Abraham kept bargaining with God for kept getting smaller. It went from 50 to 45 to 40 to 20 and finally 10. And God said, if I can find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I won't destroy those cities. Well, when we come to the beginning of Genesis 19, two angels come into the city And Lot sees them. He invites them into his home to stay the night. And just before they all get laid down to go to bed, the entire house is surrounded by men from the city who want to sexually assault these angels. Lot offers them his daughters, and people often wonder why he would do that. And it's because he had been in Sodom long enough to know that they didn't want women, so he knew they weren't going to go for his daughters. He was just simply trying to buy time to figure out what to do. But I want you to notice something from the text of Genesis 19 that I didn't notice until the other night when I was going over this. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, listen to this. This is where where Lot offers his daughters. He says, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye, do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. And notice verse 9. Here's what really stuck out to me. And they said, they being the, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow, he's talking about Lot. They're talking to each other about Lot. He said, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So they're talking about Lot in verse 9, and the Christian Standard Bible translates what they say as this. It says, this one, this one, Lot, came here as an alien, but he is acting like a judge. 
He's acting like a judge. So they say this guy came in here as a foreigner and now he's judging us. See, there was one sin you weren't allowed to commit in Sodom and Gomorrah. In any crumbling society where there's moral chaos everywhere and everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, there is still one sin you can't commit. You can't judge someone. You can tell... And here's the thing. You can tell someone... You can tell someone knows that they're doing something wrong or when they know they're saying something wrong or when they know they're living wrong because as soon as you go to offer correction, they say, you can't judge me. And so what do they say about Lot? They say, Lot, you're judging us. And Lot's really not judging them. He's just telling them no, which they perceive as the same thing. And so... They say, well, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. What they don't realize is that one day he will and they're not going to be ready. Notice what they say right after that. They say, well, now we are going to deal worse with you than with them. See, once you commit that one cardinal sin of judging someone, you will incur the wrath of a godless society whether you actually judge them or not. Now, did Lot actually judge them? Of course not. But the men of Sodom perceived his rejection of what they were doing as judgment because the society, when it is immature and demanding, can't be told no. Imagine a whiny, bratty five-year-old who wrecks the house and causes chaos because their mommy told them they couldn't have ice cream for dinner. Now take that emotional overreaction, amplify it, and multiply it by the population of Sodom, and you will have a picture of what's happening outside of Lot's house. That's why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The flagrant homosexuality in those two cities was a result of an entire society that valued their own carnal pursuits above anything and everything else. And now here's the thing. I don't have to spend too much time on the modern day application of this because I think it's quite obvious when you look around our nation that you can see people who are wrapped up in all kinds of sin and wickedness. The things that people once kept a secret are now being displayed in the open and they're proud of it. That's why the entire LGBT movement, that, that, uh, that's why the entire LGBT movement is all about pride. But we understand that the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 18, tells us that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. But I wanted to say all of that to show you where we find Lot and his wife as we remember Lot's wife this morning. The first thing I want you to notice this morning is that she heard a righteous message. Yes. Amen. Lot's wife heard a righteous message. Look at verse 15 in Genesis chapter 19. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So she heard a righteous message. One of the most prominent characteristics of angels that we find in the scriptures is that they are messengers of God. They carry a word from the throne room of God to whoever needs to hear that message. And in this verse, we find that Lot's wife heard what was at stake when the angels told Lot what was going to happen. God wanted to spare Lot despite the fact that he had made the poor choice of moving his family into Sodom. And so he sent a couple of angels to tell them what was going to happen and to help them get out of the city. Now I'm going to ask you this morning, aren't you glad that even though you've made some poor choices in your life, that God sent somebody your way with a message that you can be saved from the wrath of God which your sin deserves? Amen. Aren't you glad that somebody cared enough about your soul to bring a message from the throne room of heaven that you can be saved, sanctified, set free, and filled with the Spirit of God? There is a righteous message today that needs to be preached and it needs to be heard. John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And right after Peter preaches the first sermon of the church, the Bible said that the men were cut to the heart and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Peter said, repent. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then the verse right after that says, this promise is to you and to your children and to your children's children, as many afar off as our Lord shall call. Yes, amen. 
And so that's, there's a righteous message of repentance that needs to be heard today. Do you notice the consistency of the message between John the Baptist, Jesus, and Peter? It's a message of repentance. Repentance to turn away from your sin and to turn toward Christ. <clears throat> so what were the angels telling Lot and his family? What were the angels telling Lot and his family? They were saying, get out of here. Get out of this place of sin. And I'm thankful that one day I heard, some, I heard someone with enough God about him to tell me to get out of a place of sin and come to a place of salvation. And that's what happened with Lot and his family. The angel tried to get him to go into the mountains and he was afraid that he might die up in the mountains. So Lot asked the angels in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 19 verse 20. He said, can I escape to this little city that's not too far away? And God accepted his request to go into that city. And God promised in verse 21 that he wouldn't destroy that city. Now, let, now look at what happens in verses 21 through 25. <clears throat> Genesis 19, 21 through 25, and he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, which, I'm, which I will not overthrow this city for which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, except thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that which grew uh, upon the ground. So that righteous message that Lot's wife heard came to pass. And when we, hear a righteous me when we hear a message of righteousness that warns us to flee from the wrath to come, we need to understand that that too will come to pass. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 tells us that when Jesus returns, He will come back in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we remember that Lot's wife heard a righteous message. But not only did she hear a righteous message, but she had a righteous man. Notice as we turn our attention to Lot himself, in 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter describes the behavior and the impending judgment of false teachers using several Old Testament pictures and allegories. And this is what he says concerning how God delivers his people from ungodly circumstances in 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. He said, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning, their, verse 6 is key here, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly and delivered just Lot. Notice how in verse 7 Peter describes Lot. He calls him just. He calls him righteous. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from, the, from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord, verse 9, knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust the day of judgment to be punished. Notice how verse 8 says that Lot's righteous soul was vexed from day to day with the unlawful deeds of Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> One commentator talking about what it meant for Lot to be vexed and that Lot, what he said was that Lot was mentally distressed and exhausted by the wicked conduct of those around him. And then he asked this question, he says, are we righteous enough to be so exhausted by the sins of those around us? Are we righteous enough to be exhausted by the sins of those around us? See, here's the thing. If you're right with God, then seeing other people live in such flagrant sin is going to wear you out. I'll say that again. If you're right with God, then seeing other people live in such flagrant sin is going to wear you out. Amen. Lot may have made the mistake of going to live in Sodom, but his righteousness would not allow him to be comfortable there or to be comfortable with what was going on there. Listen, you can be righteous and find yourself through your own poor choices in unrighteous circumstances. And when you do, you're not going to be comfortable. Amen. <clears throat> you can make poor choices. You can, you can do as my wife says and march in the poor choice parade. And when you do, 
You're going to find yourself in an uncomfortable circumstance because the conviction of the Holy Ghost is going to grab a hold of your heart and tell you you didn't do right and you need to get right before it's too late. Yes, amen. amen. <clears throat> and so the conditions of the world in which we live should make us uncomfortable. The conditions of the world in which we live should make us uncomfortable. When you look at how bad things have gotten, it should make you like Abraham who looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. And so we see that Lot's wife heard a righteous message. We see that she had a righteous man. But in in spite of those two good things in her life, she left an unrighteous memorial. I'll say that again for those of you who take notes. She heard a righteous message. She had a righteous man and she left an unrighteous message memorial. <clears throat> Look at verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. If you notice back in verse 16 of this chapter, the Bible said that Lot lingered. <clears throat> and while he lingered, the angels grabbed him, they grabbed his wife, they grabbed their two daughters. And you see, Lot may have made the mistake of lingering. But once he got turned away from the city, he obeyed the command of the angels and he didn't look back. But his wife looked back and she paid a price. You see, there are some folks who may linger in sin for a little while after they hear the gospel, but when they get turned around, they don't look back. They book it with one foot in front of the other, leaving their sin behind them. But then there are other folks, they hear the message, they start to obey, but then they look back. And and why why do they look back? why is it that people start down a path of righteousness and then turn around and look back? Well, what it all comes down to is they make excuses. They say, well, I don't know if I can live that kind of life, and so they look back. They say, well, the church is just so full of hypocrites, and then they look back. And they say, well, somebody was mean to me at church once, and then they look back. And they say, well, church folks just judge me all the time, and so they look back. But see, when Lot's wife looked back, she may not have realized that she wasn't going to have another chance at repentance. Yes, <clears throat> Lot's wife might have thought that she could just look back a little while and then she could turn away, but she didn't get another chance. See, if you're living in sin this morning, you can bet, you, 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 if you're living in sin, you can't bet on another chance to repent. You can't bet on getting things right with God another day. You can't bet on living another moment in an unrepentant state. I believe there is a time coming in every unbeliever's life if they reject the preaching of the gospel enough times, their consciences become seared with a hot iron. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 6, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. There's going to come a point where if you're in sin and you're not right with God and you keep looking back at sin, eventually you're not going to have an opportunity to repent because you won't want to repent. John chapter 6 verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. At some point, the the longer you look back at sin and the more you turn away from God and the more you keep just, just throwing off the conviction of the Spirit, eventually the Father is going to stop drawing. Yes, amen. And when the Father stops drawing, you're not going to want to repent. You're not going to want to come home. You're not going to want to leave the hog pen like the prodigal son did. You're going to want to stay there because that's the only thing that gives you pleasure. That's the only thing that gives you life. And if that's all the life you have, then eventually your life is going to run out. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. The problem with a lot of folks is all they have is natural life. They don't have eternal life. And because they don't have eternal life, because they've not called out to God, because they've not repented of their sin, because they refuse to hear the gospel and heed its warning, all they're going to have is eternal death. And I don't want that to be us this morning. When you stop feeling the drawing power of God's Spirit, then you're in a dangerous place. This morning we're going to sing a closing song. And uh, as we sing this morning, I want you to stand all across this house. Song song leader, would you come on? If y'all would go ahead and stand this morning.
This morning we need to remember Lot's wife. <coughs> Lot's wife heard a righteous message, but that didn't save her. You can hear the message of the gospel, and it, and it simply won't save you by you hearing it. Lot's wife had a righteous man, but he couldn't save her. You can have righteous people in your life who try to get you to make the right decisions, but simply having the right people in your life won't save you. Simply having the right people in your life won't make you right. Because she didn't give heed to the, to the, to the righteous message, because she didn't give heed to her righteous man, she left an unrighteous memorial. And we are in danger of doing the same thing if we do not repent, believe the gospel. The only way to get right with God this morning is by completely trusting Him to save us, cleanse us, and give us peace with Him. I don't want to make any assumptions about the soul of anybody here this morning, but I will read you this passage from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to pray for us this morning and if you need to come to the altar and make things right, God will pray with you and pray for you. Father in heaven, I tried to bring the message this morning I feel that you've given me. And I pray this morning that as we stand here in your presence that you would cause the work of your Holy Spirit to make these truths plain on our hearts and minds and that we would submit ourselves to you more fully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you've got a need this morning, now is the time to come get what you need from the Lord. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of doing emotional altar calls. I'm not a fan of trying to manipulate people to the altar. I just preach the gospel and let God do the work.